right, test one, two, three. All right, I have, I need some volunteers. Miles, come here. Miles. Grace, hurry up, Grace, I need you here. Grace, Alexis, hurry up. Archer, come on, man. Okay, okay, see if they need a pen, and then everybody needs to get a post-it note, okay? Post-it note. Here, you can have pens. All right, everybody needs a post-it note, okay? All adults, youth, post-it note, okay? And then if they need a pen, go for it, everybody. Divide up and divide and conquer. All right, they're going to, I want everybody to have a post-it note, okay? Everybody needs a post-it note. Don't write on it until I tell you to, okay? Um, and if you need a pen, they ha- do have some pens. Um, they do have some pens there, so... Um, you may have one in your purse or your pocket or whatever, so if you don't need one. But um, everybody get a post-it note, okay? So we've been, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the fear of the Lord from Proverbs. And that was received really well. And uh, we just talked about, you know, the fear of God creates delight in our life because we see that God is a, he's this awesome creator creates gratitude because he's our redeemer. There's that idea of awe and uh, fear because he has done that. Um, it creates trust because we see how he provides for us. And just heard an awesome testimony this week of, uh, of that. Maybe we'll maybe have him share here in the next week or two. And then purity because he is our God. There's also that reverence factor, that idea that there's an awe. He's a holy God and we're all sinners saved by God's grace. And so there's also that factor of fear there too that we're coming before a holy God. And so then last week we went into 1 Peter chapter 1, talked about this idea of holiness a little bit. You don't hear as much um, preaching on holiness like there used to be. When I was, grew up in the church, holiness was just really hit really hard and um, maybe too hard, <laughs> maybe too hard at times. And uh, I always thought, man, I didn't know if I was going to heaven or not. Um, um, but we talked about the, how God uses trials in our life to sanctify us and purify us. And that was just really, re- <laughs> you got one? You need a pen. All right. There you go. Um, but it does. God does purify us through sometimes the difficulties of life and trials. Okay. Everybody got a post a note and pen? All right. We're good. Okay. Um, and then all believers are called to be holy. Sanctification is a cooperative effort. In other words, I have to work with God. God will sanctify me. He'll declare me righteous before Him. He died on the cross for my sins, right? But, but I still have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to live that out and walk that out in my life, okay? And um, so I can't just sit in my lazy boy recliner with the remote and say, God, make me holy, Right? I still have to walk it out. I still have to make decisions being led by God's Holy Spirit uh, for Him to change and, and lead me. So uh, this morning I want to talk a little more about this idea. It's going on chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Um, what is the end result or goal of holiness? And I touched upon this last week a little bit that I think sometimes the easy thing to think is that holiness is the goal. Moral purity. Well, it kind of is, but that isn't the end, okay? Because if that's the end, there's a lot of people in this world that are morally pure. And I would even maybe argue that there's some religions that have people that are more pure in their morality than sometimes Christians are. But I don't think they have the hope of heaven. And so holiness isn't the end all. It leads to some things. It can lead to, actually, it can lead to legalism. Legalism is, well, it's all about rules, and then you can even get a little bit self-righteous, thinking I'm more holy than somebody else, when God says, you know, even our righteousness is, is filthy to Him. So, um, and it also can lead vo- void of any relationship with God. So, what is the end goal of holiness? That's what we're going to unpack, all right? We're going to be in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, picking it up in verse 4. Verse 4. Good thing you took the box that still had some in there. All right. Um, 4 through 10 of chapter 2, all right, is where we'll be at. Let's bow our heads in some prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege and the honor to, to study your word and to know your truth, Lord God. 
Uh, Make it come alive to us this day. Let it change and transform us and make us into the people you've called us to be, people that reflect who you are to the world around us. We give you the thanks. We ask it in your name. Amen. Verse 4, it says, as you come to him, say that. As you, all right, so that's continuous. We'll talk a little more. Who, who are we coming to? Well, we're coming to the living stone, all right? And that is a little bit of an oxymoron, could you say that? Right? Because it's um, a stone isn't usually living, right? But he is the living stone. He's rejected by humans but chosen, okay? You can underline how many times or highlight how many times chosen is using, used in this text here. Chosen by God and precious to Him. You also are like, what? Living stone. So He's the big living stone. We're the small living stone. Okay? And we're being built together to form a spiritual house, a temple to be a holy priesthood entering into um, by spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For Him says in Scripture, this is from Isaiah 28, 16, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Verse 7, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Again, this is Psalms 118, verse 22. And then he also quotes back from Isaiah again, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, Isaiah 8, 14. And so Jesus would help be a stepping stone for some to know God, but he also would be a stumbling stone for some because they would, especially some of the Jewish people, would trip over um, him and it would cause them to turn away from God. They would reject the cornerstone. All right. They stumble because they disobey the message which is also what they were destined for. Verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. How many are glad you received mercy? Amen. Three things that uh, I want us to understand here this morning on this idea of holiness, why holiness is important. First of all, we need to understand our focus. Understand your focus. That's point number one. If you want to wander through life and hope for the best, you can do that. But usually you're going to end up going in circles. And I've proved that. Okay, I've been hunting at night. And it's kind of like I, was, I thought I was going in one direction and then all of a sudden... 10, 20 minutes later, I am back in the exact same spot where I started. And I tell you what, that really messes with you. But it happens. If we wander through life and we don't know where we are headed, you're going to end up going through cir- in circles throughout life. If you want morality and rules, there's several religions that can accommodate you, but I don't know if they'll always lead to Christ. If you want to pursue the pleasures of this world, a lot of people do, you just have to be willing to live with the consequences right? And it won't lead to Christ. But if you want to be in a relationship with the Holy God, know that your sins are forgiven, that you have the hope of heaven, then your focus must be on Christ. It must be Jesus. He is the chosen cornerstone, the living stone. It's upon Him we must build our life. The cornerstone was so vital back in those days, biblical times, of a foundation, right? It had to be true. It had to be strong. Because it it set the tone. If it was crooked, the whole building was going to be crooked. Right? It wouldn't be in alignment. He was the perfect, the tried, the perfect cornerstone. And we build our life upon Him. And verse 4 says, as you come to Him, it's continuous aspect. So in other words, we just don't come to Him once. We're constantly coming to Jesus day after day, having our eyes focused on Him. Peter urges the believers to draw near and and choose Jesus as the precious cornerstone, the one and only living stone. And if you, uh, last week we covered that these believers were living in modern day Turkey or Asia back then. And they were there, they'd been persecuted. Okay, that's, we talked about the trials providing holiness. They'd been persecuted, they'd been scattered. 
All right, and they were looking for a place where they could live out their faith without being persecuted. And he encourages them to draw near to God, a holy God, and to know Him. This is what I know, that if you have a focus, you are more likely to take the necessary steps to reach that goal, right? It is true in athletics. It's true in academics. It's true with work. When you have a focus, the chances of you ending up where you want to be are much higher than if you go around in circles. Every once in a while, that works, but not very often. You have to have a focus. And when Christ is your focus, then holiness makes sense because I understand I'm making those hard choices because I want to draw close to a holy God and have fellowship with Him. You following me? If, if holiness is the end in itself, it's kind of like it can get a little old, right? It's kind of like, man, I'm going to have to make this choice, right? But when the focus is I want to know Christ and draw closer to Him, then holiness makes a lot more sense because I'm pursuing a holy God. Holiness draws us near to Jesus without being destroyed. We have fellowship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the whole universe. Now the priests, and that is used in here a little bit, you're a royal priesthood. The priests had an advantage right in the Old Testament times. They could go into the temple where the presence of God was. And even the high priest, once a year, there was a high priest that could go into the most holy place. Now that was... You know, it was a good thing. It's kind of cool. You got to go into the Ark of the Covenant, right? Him and Andy, Indiana Jones, right? All right. You got to go into the Ark of the Covenant where it was at. But there was a little bit of a downside on that. When they walked in there, they had something tied to their leg. Why? Yeah, because if their life wasn't holy and they came into the presence of God, whew, yeah. And so nobody else wanted to go in there, so they'd pull them out with the rope, right? And so it was a privilege of the priest to go into the holy place and the most holy place. But they couldn't do it without sacrifices being made, without living according to the guidelines that God had laid out for them. Because if they approached God and, and they weren't holy and the sacrifices had not been made for them, there was consequences for that as well. So they had the privilege of going in there, but it also came with some guidelines, right? New Testament time, when Jesus died on the cross, right, what happened? Well, it's one of the things that happened when he died on the cross immediately in the temple. The curtain was ripped between the holy place and the most holy place, right? Thunder, lightning. Why was the curtain ripped? Because now all people had access into the very presence of God because of the blood of Christ. And so Hebrews picks up on that. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. You can turn there. It'll be on the screen. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way open to us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, and that great high priest is Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the faith we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. You see that? There was an awe to go into the very presence of God. And for them, whether they had experienced it or seen it or knew somebody that had been nuked, can we call it that? All right. They had heard the stories. And that put a fear in their heart, and it's kind of like, I don't know if I, yeah, it's cool to go into the very presence of God. I don't know if I want to do that or not, right? And the author of Hebrews says, draw near to God. We can with confidence because of Jesus. That is the goal of holiness. One of the goals is that we can draw near to Him and enter into that close relationship with God. Amen? Amen. God isn't just meant to be out there and we're here and we live our life and the world goes on. It's meant to be where we have a relationship with Him. And all relationships 
we have to do certain things. If you are married, you know that, that when you are married, there's certain things you do and things you don't do if you want that relationship to be good, right? Am I right? I can use some humor in there, but it's also very serious, right? If you're married and you've been married for a while, you've all crossed that line, whether husband or wife. You've done things to hurt or to make them mad. And so we do things because we want that close relationship. You can laugh because we, if you've been married, you've all been there, right? But sometimes it's not a laughing situation because we hurt people. God wants us to be in that close relationship with Him. Holiness provides that way that we can enter into that. Amen? Secondly, we see that we have to understand, you have to understand your identity. Peter reminds these people that they're not ordinary people. They're extraordinary. They're chosen people. They are precious to God. And I just wonder, do you love each day with the truth that truth in front of you, that you are chosen and that you are precious. And I'm going to look at most of you if I can. Do you live with that truth, that you are chosen and you are precious to God? So much so that He was willing to go to the cross for you, for you. I know many of us have the opposite thought in our minds at times, maybe not all the time, but you dwell on your failures. You dwell on that you're not good enough, you're not holy enough. You have a lot of past failures and evidence to support your point, all right? And Satan is pretty good about reminding you. If you, if you, know, if you think you're going to forget, he'll remind you, right? Right? We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's grace. And God loves us. He pursues us with an everlasting love. And he has chosen you. You are his prized possession even above the angels and all the things that He created, human beings are God's prized possession that He wants to be in relationship with. How would your life change if you woke up each morning with that truth in front of you that I am chosen by God? Verse 9 says, you are a chosen people. And that word people, if you look in the original language, it means people that are thought to be of the same genetic stock. Now, we're not all... We don't all have the same DNA. But what I do know, I suppose if you go back far enough, they, you would. But what I do know is that we all have that same DNA that we belong to Christ, right? And we're His chosen people that declare His praises. Holiness allows us to be what God has called us to be. So that is the other. Not only does it allow us to draw near to God, but it allows us to become who God calls us to be and He wants us to be. Right, Clarence? Right. That's right. All right. He's tracking with me. All right. And that our heart, our life can be a place where God's Spirit dwells. So when I was entering into ministry where I did my internship up way up in Williston, North Dakota, they would give out this pamphlet called My Heart, Christ's Home. Anybody heard of it? it it's just a short pamphlet, but it, it really stuck with me because it, the imagery was that my heart is like my home, okay? Okay, and, and so think of your home, all right? Whether you're renting, apartment, you own your home, whatever the case, it doesn't matter. But you have your home, and it's like your heart, okay? And so you have the neighbors come in, and Jesus is going to come. He's your guest that day. And so what do you do? You make sure the living room, the kitchen looks good, right? Okay, and if you're really thorough, maybe you make sure the bedroom is clean or you close the door, right? All right? And then, but there's certain places, maybe it's the basement, maybe it's the attic, maybe it's a couple of the other rooms that you got stuff piled in there, right? And you just don't want anybody to see, or maybe you even got some secrets there. And what the point of the book is that often we'll let our guests and Jesus come into our house, but we only allow him access to certain rooms. There's some rooms that we keep closed because of the secret, because of the sins, because of the things that are there. And what it really brings apart, if we want God to dwell in our heart and all of our heart, we have to open up all those rooms to his presence and let him help us clean house. That's why he's given us his Holy Spirit. It's a little bit hard to do that, isn't it? But I believe when we do that, that's where Christ, we just don't want Christ dwelling, living in our living room. We want Him in all of our heart. 
one of the commentary that I was looking at says, there is encouragement in these verses in this sense. As you keep coming to Christ, so there's that continuous aspect, in worship and prayer and praise, you're continually being built into a spiritual temple, a place where God more and more fully dwells. So there is that aspect of sanctification and holiness where I'm declared holy the minute I invite Christ into my life because of the blood of Christ. But the other part of sanctification is that I'm still growing in that, right? I'm still becoming who I am, my identity in Christ, um, and growing up into Him. Paul says this in Ephesians, so if you want to turn your Bible to Ephesians, go back a book or two or on the screen. It says, He reminds us. I think we need to be reminded who we are, our identity. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship. You can put daughters in there as well. Through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him we have redemption through His blood. So this is touching upon a lot of things we've been working on. For the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace in which He's lavished on us. And that word is like super lavish. He's kind of like, He's pouring it on you, right? I don't know if we always think that God is just pouring out His love and His grace and mercy on us. That's what Paul is bringing across here. Verse 8, he's lavished it on us, all wisdom, understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect in the times when they reached their fulfillment, to bring unity in all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him you were also, what? Chosen. Having been predestined according to the plan in him who works out everything in conformity to his purpose and to his will, in order that we who were the first to be put to the hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard of the message of truth and the gospel of salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who deposited and guaranteed our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. And so that last part has to deal with that when we invite Christ in His life, into our life, the Holy Spirit is there. And that is... That's a sign that we've, we're His. We belong to Him. His Spirit is in us, right? But we are chosen. So you are God's treasured possession. You've been chosen by Him. And if it's any assurance, I need to remind myself that on a daily basis. Some days better than others. But there's days that I have to remind myself, man, God loves me. He's chosen me. He's redeemed me. And I'm precious to Him. Because life sometimes teaches us otherwise. Sometimes we're rejected by people. Sometimes it's our own decisions where we think that, that wasn't a godly decision and I know it. You know, sometimes it takes a while for us to grow into what we've become. It's that idea of perfection being maturity, that we are growing up into who He's called us to be. Um, it takes time. So, you have your post-it note, all right? On your post-it note, you can put some designs on there. If you want to make it girly, you can make it girly. If you want to make it masculine, you can make it. But I want you to write on there, I am chosen. I am chosen, okay? And the goal is to take it home and put it someplace where you see it. So, guys, you can put it on the refrigerator. Ladies, you can put it or on the mirror, bathroom mirror, on the microwave. I want you to put it where you will see it in the morning and remember that you are chosen. I am chosen. Amen? Our last point. Understand your purpose. Understand your purpose. Those last few verses of uh, chapter 2 that we were looking at, 9 and 10. I guess it's the middle of the chapter, but the last part of our section It says that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare His praises. 
of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And he says, you know, you once were not a people. They weren't Christians. They weren't good people. They were secular people. They probably did a lot of bad things. But now God had called them. They'd been redeemed. Their lives had been changed and transformed. But now they were a royal priesthood, the people of God, His chosen possession to declare God's praises to the world around them. Amen? That describes many of us. It should describe all of us. The third thing is that holiness leads to a powerful declaration and witness to a secular world who God is. There's nothing more damaging to claim that you are a Christian and then your life does not resemble what Scripture says. Okay? And it doesn't have to be other Christians that are telling you that or your pastor. The world will notice. They're watching you more than you realize. Especially if you say, I am a Christian. They're looking for your life. They're looking at it. Does it align? The words that you say, your actions, your jokes, your, what you do on your free time, they know what you watch. They know what you do. They're watching your life. And either our life can give a great testimony of who God is or it can have the opposite effect and say, yeah, you know what, I, I know those Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites, right? They say one thing, but they totally live their life in a different way. We're to radiate God's presence to the world around us. And to me, I, I find this part a little bit humbling because um, we are all growing, right? We all make mistakes. We can all do things no matter how long we've been walking with Christ. Going back to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Maybe you know 2, 8, 9. It says you've been saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works so that nobody can boast. And then there's verse 10 that sometimes maybe we leave off. And you are God's handiwork, right? You're his, he's the craftsman and He's designed you. He's created you. You are His special possession, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance to do. Jesus has chosen you. He's shaped and He's formed you. You are His chosen person. And we're His chosen instruments to declare His praise, His glory to the world around us. And sometimes our world can be a little bit dark, all right? You know what? And it's in the darkness that a light shines all the brighter, isn't it? All right? Sometimes when it's bright outside, you don't notice the lights as much, right? But in the darkness, you really see it. It pops. It stands out. If it's dark, your light is going to shine all that much more brighter. I'm going to have the musicians come. I think all of our kids liked rock hunting. I enjoyed doing it from time to time. Anybody rock hunters out there? Right? In fact, we just gave Daniel back his box of rocks. <laughs> I said, okay, we're entrusting them back to you. You know, the beauty of a rock is kind of in the eyes of the beholder, right? It's the one that's looking for him. There's something. Maybe it's the shape. Maybe it's the color, the composition, right? Where you find it. But there's something that attracts us to it. And I was just thinking about that. You know, you are precious and chosen by God. God sees something in you and I. And sometimes there's mud on the surface. There's debris. There's a film. But once you remove all that, you polish it up, it's kind of like, wow. That rock really pops. And that's the way God looks at our life. That's the way He looks at our lives. To God, you are precious. You are chosen by Him. Has He called us to holiness? Absolutely. But it's not the end in itself. The purpose of holiness is that it draws us into a closer relationship with God. It helps us understand what God has called us to be. We're set apart for His glory and for His honor to declare His praises to the world around us. Amen? So I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. Sometimes we do this, but not very often. But I'm going to have you close your eyes. And I'm going to have you raise your hand at different points here. So, But this morning you say, you know what? I The first point... I don't know if I have a relationship with God. 
I don't know if I know God. I don't know if I have the hope of salvation. I don't know if my sins are forgiven. But I want to know that this morning before I leave. So would you raise your hand if that's you? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. Let's pray together. Just a prayer of salvation saying, God, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and purify me for your glory and for your honor. Give me your hope within my life. Amen. And God, you know the people that raised their hand this morning, and I, I don't know what happened in their life this week, this day, this month. You God, you see it all. But you call us to confess our sins, and when we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. So, God, we thank you and we praise you. So, the second question for all of us here today is Do you know that you are chosen, that you are called by him, and that you are precious? And if that truth just needs to really be drilled into you because the lies are telling you the opposite, I just want you to raise your hand this morning just saying, you know what, I I need that truth in my heart. I know it in my, my head, but I need to know it in my heart that God loves me, that I'm precious to Him. Amen. Yes, thank you. Any others this morning? And then the last question is, I want to be that witness. I want to declare God's praises in my life. And I want to do it better. Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Lord God, you see the hands that have been raised. And holiness, Lord, is more than us saying, yeah, man, I'm... I'm such a good person because all that does is leads to our own self-righteousness. The goal of holiness is that we can enter into a relationship with you and draw close to a holiness of God. To be like an Isaiah or a Daniel or a John, a Paul. And the list goes on. to walk with you and then to know who we are to see our lives as you see us Lord and then to declare your praises to the world around us Lord Lord we need your help in this and Lord God I pray that you would come into our heart and into our lives as only you can we give you the thanks we give you the praise we ask it in your name Amen Would you stand this morning, sing this song, just worship Him this morning. If you need prayer this morning, would you make your way forward and... Amen. Kevin and Kate, could you join me over here? uh, If you need prayer this morning... For need or request, I'm looking for Jason Witt. There he is. Hey, you guys are up here already. Pray away when you're done. Come over here, all right? You know, God's good, isn't he? God is good. He's faithful. I hope these messages, it does lead up to Easter. Because it's about his resurrection. It's also his death on the cross, but it's also his resurrection. Because the resurrection, if Jesus died on the cross, Paul said, but he wasn't resurrected, Christ died in vain, right? Because it's through the resurrection we have hope of heaven, but also the strength to live it out. And we have the hope of the resurrection. Amen? Amen. Yeah, come on over here, you guys. Oneida, ah, beautiful skirt. Yes, yes. 
um, and Jason. So you guys brought cupcakes today, didn't you? Yes, we did. Um, Here. Yeah, it's on. All right. We, uh, we just wanted to celebrate Jared's upcoming birthday here. He's going to be turning one. Um, and we want to thank all our brothers and sisters here for the continued prayers to help us get through the hard times. Um, his first 30 days were up in Children's Hospital. And as you can see, God's had his hand on him and in our whole family uh, the entire time. And we just uh, want to thank you guys all so much for the continued support. Amen. Yeah, so if you remember back, it was a year ago, um, born, everything was normal, and then he stopped breathing yep. a couple different times. And uh, he had a bla- brain bleed. And uh, how many weeks were you up at the Children's Hospital? Three and a half weeks. And he checks out totally normal now. Yeah, everything's totally normal. perfect. It's all gone it's like nothing was ever there. Yeah. So thank you, Lord. Yeah. Lord, we just, I thank you for Jason and Anita. And uh, they've got three boys, three beautiful boys. And we thank you for answered prayer with Jared, Lord God. We just give you the thanks. We give you the glory for your mighty power and your work. And uh, give you the thanks. Bless our fellowship afterwards. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Did you want to say a few words too, Jared? Yeah. He likes the microphone. (laughs) Maybe someday you will be up here doing this. All right? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hey, God bless you this morning. Greet each other as you leave. And enjoy the cupcakes.